Hi. I'm going to talk about marshmallows, actually. Um, but first, I'm going to talk about sleep so you can understand why I'm talking about marshmallows. I can't believe they showed that video. That was perfect timing. Um, when people find out that I am a sleep researcher at the Sleep and Performance Research Center at Washington State University, I will very typically get a question from people. And they'll ask me, how can I get by on less sleep? What can I do to get by on, on less sleep? Because I don't want to spend eight hours, one third of my life, every day in bed doing, being unproductive. Okay? And the answer that I always give them is actually, you can't afford to get less than eight hours of sleep, so don't skimp on sleep. And I'm going to spend about the next 10 minutes here telling you all about the scientific data that tell us how important it is to get seven to eight hours of sleep per night. Okay. I say this not based on my own personal opinion, but on the consensus of the American Academy of Sleep Medicine and the National Sleep Research Society, of which I'm a member. The American Academy of Sleep Medicine is an organization of thousands of doctors who treat people with sleep disorders or people who voluntarily cur curtail their sleep and get by on less than eight hours of sleep per night. So people have various health ailments associated with that, and those of us in the Sleep Research Society use scientific methods to measure the effects of sleep insufficiency on health outcomes. And there was rec uh, recently, earlier this year, the two societies collectively put out a consensus statement that showed that a number of negative health outcomes, adverse health outcomes, are associated with getting seven hours or less of sleep per night. You can see them here. We've had things such as obesity, diabetes, short-term memory loss, increased pain, impaired immune function, impaired performance. Any one of these would be bad enough, but when you restrict yourself to less than seven hours of sleep per night, you try to get by on five, six hours of sleep per night, you're subjecting yourself to all of these adverse health outcomes. And ultimately, the granddaddy of all negative health outcomes, mortality. We like to use big words in biomedical sciences. Mortality is a big word for death. It sounds a lot more pleasant or at least more neutral than death. So let's go with mortality here. But this is showing us the statistical relationship between the amount of time spent uh, asleep per night um, and the odds of death within six years. So they took middle-aged men. They asked them, how much sleep do you get per night? And then they followed them over a period of six years and asked what the odds were that these people would die over this period of six years. I'm sorry, would experience mortality over this period of six years. And they found that individuals getting four or less hours of sleep ended up with a 2.8-fold increase in the risk of death over that six-year period relative to those that got seven or eight hours of sleep. This isn't exactly the north face of uh, Mount Athabasca, but I wouldn't want to have a three-fold increase of dying over a six-year period. So I aim for the middle of this curve. I aim for about seven hours a night. Now, again, this is a statistical relationship. If you've taken a statistics course, we know that uh, correlation is not necessarily causation. But I showed you all the negative health outcomes on the previous slide, which, of course, would contribute to increased mortality. So we do, as uh, a consensus of the American Academy of Sleep Medicine and the Sleep Research Society, uh, think of this as a, what is likely to be a causal relationship. If you choose to get by on less than five hours of sleep a night, you could pay the ultimate price for that. Now, why is it that you might pay the ultimate price for that? Well, um, first of all, we render our immune system vulnerable when we don't get enough sleep per night. So a recent study measured mitochondrial DNA in the immune cells, the circulating cells that help us fight off infections. Okay, and so mitochondrial DNA is a measure of the uh, number of mitochondria that are in these circulating cells. Mitochondria are basically the battery pack for a cell, okay? And they found that you have reduced mitochondrial DNA in circulating immune cells when you have insufficient sleep, when you choose to get by with five or six hours of sleep per night relative to when you're an individual who's sleeping eight hours per night, okay? So those immune cells are running out of energy, and this is perhaps why other studies have shown that vaccinations are less effective when we uh, undergo sleep deprivation, uh, and that we are more vulnerable to infection with the common cold if exposed to the virus that causes the common cold. So how ironic, you know, I want to get by with five hours of sleep a night. Well, now all of a sudden I've got to spend 12 hours in bed at night for three, four, five days to get over the flu that I got because I was spending only five hours in bed. 
at night, okay? So don't skimp on sleep. Now, this is infectious disease. We've got a pretty good handle on infectious diseases in this day and age, but let's talk about some more significant killers. How about obesity and its co-conspirators, diabetes, heart disease, stroke? Okay, so there's some studies that show very clearly that there is a statistical relationship between insufficient sleep and obesity. So we're looking here at data from a long-term study, um, looking at body mass index. Body mass index, a fancy word for how much fat you're carrying around on your body. Um, they took people who were at equivalent weights at baseline. They then monitored the amount of sleep that these people were getting over a period of five years, and they monitored their weight over a period of five years. And you can see from the data schematized here that those who slept five or less hours of sleep per night showed a significant weight gain. Those who slept around eight hours per night showed a relatively stable weight, okay? So it seems that there is a statistical relationship between the amount of sleep we get and trends in our weight. Now, is this a causative relationship? Again, we think it is based on some of the data I'll show you next. Okay, so this is a study where they took people into a laboratory and they kept them in the laboratory for two weeks. During those two weeks, they were under two different conditions. Either they were allowed to sleep five hours a night or they were allowed to sleep nine hours a night. Okay, and we're looking here at their carbohydrate intake and changes in weight. And these were um, young adult female subjects. Um, so we have a red zone and we have a green zone. The red zone being five hours of sleep. You could see that the uh, number of carbohydrates, or the amount of carbohydrates eaten was greater when they were only allowed to sleep for five hours a night relative to nine hours a night. And this impacted their weight over, this is just five days here. We had a 1.1 pound weight gain in individuals who were restricted to five hours of sleep. We had a little bit of weight loss in the individuals that were subjected, that were allowed to sleep nine hours, okay? So these data out of the University of Colorado show that when you restrict your sleep, when you get by on five hours of sleep per night, you are paying a price in terms of weight gain. That's just the, the short term. Obviously, you'd cap out at some point, but um, these things in the long term are not pretty. Okay, now why does this happen? This has something to do with the hunger hormone that is produced by our stomach, ghrelin. Okay, so when your stomach is empty, you say your stomach is growling. Well, your stomach is producing ghrelin when it's growling. And that ghrelin goes to the circulation. I didn't name this thing, by the way. It, was, it happened to be a nice coincidence that it nice alliteration like that. Um, so, your stomach's growling, your stomach releases ghrelin, that goes into the circulation, it goes into your brain, your brain says, oh, I need to eat, okay? And so the amount that you're going to eat is going to be proportional to the amount of ghrelin that is being produced by your stomach. When uh, we look at the amount of ghrelin that is circulating in individuals who are sleeping less than five hours a night out of habit, we see that those ghrelin levels are elevated relative to individuals who sleep eight hours a night, okay? And so you have a very strong eat signal if you're sleeping five or less hours a night. So of course, those people that they took into the laboratory at the University of Colorado, they had this signal saying, eat, 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 and that's precisely what they did, and they had weight gain over that period of five days, okay? What else? Let's talk about glucose metabolism, okay? Now we're getting a little more esoteric, but bear with me here. I'll talk about marshmallows in a couple of minutes. Um, glucose metabolism, it varies as a function of the amount of time that we spend asleep. I know this, this comes from personal experience. So when I was in graduate school, I volunteered to serve as a research subject in a, one of these sleep deprivation studies. Um, I did it in part because I wanted to advance science and in part because they actually pay very well in some of these sleep deprivation studies. Um, so I needed the money and I did it. So they had us in the laboratory for two weeks. Again, two conditions. One week we were allowed to sleep only four hours a night. So they kept us awake till 1 a.m. They woke us up at 5 a.m. Uh, and then the other week, they allowed us to sleep eight hours a night, okay? And they monitor, monitored our metabolism throughout that whole experiment. And it happened to be a friend of mine doing this experiment. After the experiment was over, he was looking at my data, and he was like, and I was, I don't know, 25, 26 at the time. He's like, dude, 
at the end of that week when you were here and you were only allowed to sleep four hours a night, your body had the metabolic profile of like a 68-year-old man. And I was like, oh, dude, great. So <laughs> that's the red zone there. My glucose metabolism was lower when I had four hours of sleep a night than when I had eight hours of sleep per night. Now, to give this some context, let's think about those kids that you saw eating marshmallows uh, in that video that, that happened to be up before I was, I was up here. Um, kids love marshmallows, right? They're loaded with sugar. That's because kids have a very high glucose metabolism. They can eat, you know, I, I, I didn't actually see the whole video. It looks like they're eating a bunch of them. But you, kids can eat all sorts of marshmallows. They can stuff their face full of marshmallows, um, eat them, and then ask for more. And that's because they have a very high rate of glucose metabolism. They'll take that glucose, they'll convert it into glycogen. It's stored in muscles, it's stored in the liver, and they've got all the energy they need for a day full of play and activities, right? If you subjected someone who's 68 years old to that same test that you saw in the video, it would be pretty boring, actually. Because someone who's 68 years old would be like, I don't eat marshmallows. I, I, no, I, I can't process that much sugar. Exactly. Someone who's 68 years old can't process that much sugar. But it's a gradual aging process that occurs over six decades. And they have come to learn slowly, gradually, over six decades, that their body can't process sugar. Well, I went from the green zone here to the red zone over a period of like three to five days. And I didn't know that my glucose metabolism shut down all of a sudden in three to five days. And, you know, if my friend hadn't been there to say like, dude, you got it, the metabolism of a 68-year-old, I might never know that. So let's think about somebody who's 20 years old, who's maybe a student. You know, they go through the week. They've got a lot of studying that they're doing for an exam or something, and they're up late. And... All of a sudden, they've given themselves the metabolism of a 68-year-old, and they don't know it. And then, okay, the weekend comes, they can sleep in Saturday, Friday, Saturday. Then they recover, they get back their 20-year-old metabolism. Then the next week comes along, and they got to, you know, we're, we're all busy. You got to watch TV and see what the Kardashians are up to. You got to get through the Facebook postings to see if your friend's cats have done anything interesting. <laughs> there are TED videos to watch. By the way, if it's between 11 p.m., 6 a.m., you're watching this video at home, shut down your device, get in bed, and get some sleep. Sorry about that. So, you know, you go through these cycles where you're having five hours of sleep, then you're having eight hours of sleep, and your glucose metabolism is fluctuating all over the place. Well, this is something called a pre-diabetic state, okay? Glucose has toxic effects on our nervous system. It prevents wound healing. You have all sorts of things that go wrong in a pre-diabetic state. And in fact, some of these long-term studies show that if you restrict yourself of sleep, you choose to uh, get by on five hours of sleep a night for a period of years, your odds of getting uh, type 2 diabetes are increased, okay? So we don't want to mess with our glucose metabolism. We don't want to skimp on sleep. All right, now maybe you're young. I see some young people in the audience. All these things are almost theoretical abstractions to you. Obesity, heart disease, stroke, whatever. Those are for old people. I don't care. Uh, in fact, if you're not mindful of your sleep in the short term, you won't make it to be an old person and have worries like that. And that's because of the effects of insufficient sleep on the brain. Insufficient sleep causes something that we sleep scientists like to call psychomotor vigilance lapses. Again, we like big fancy words in biomedical research. Rather than try to explain those words to you, I'll just demonstrate it, because I see it, I'm woefully familiar with it. I see it in my students all the time. If I tend to lecture on for too long, and they'll do something like this. <laughs> Psychomotor vigilance lapse, nodding off, okay? All right, now these are data from some of my colleagues at Washington State University looking at the two scenarios. We have individuals who are well-rested and individuals who have gone, undergone one night of sleep deprivation. By the way, this one night of total sleep deprivation, you'll see similar effects if you don't sleep, if you choose to uh, sleep for three or five hours of sleep a night for a week, you'll see a similar effect on these lapses. And what we're looking at here is the number of psychomotor lapses in a 10-minute test period. Okay, so when you're well rested, you're not going to have any of these. You'll have less than one in a 10 minute test period. Um, when you undergo a night of sleep deprivation, you'll typically have greater than 16 of these in a 10 minute test period. Okay, and my colleagues will often study these in the context of people who are in a driving simulator. 
Now that's interesting. Driving, what does this have to do with psychomotor vigilance lapses? Well, let's see. These lapses are typically half a second to two seconds in duration. Let's just do a little math here. So if you're traveling 60 miles per hour, this means you're traveling one mile per minute, which translate in, translates into 88 feet per second, which is about 176 feet in a two second lapse. Where will you be when your psychomotor vigilance lapse occurs, okay? If you feel like you need to get by on five hours of sleep a night, think again because you don't know where you'll be when your psychomotor vigilance lapse occurs. There are 30,000 auto accident, uh, fatal auto accidents a year in the U.S. Well over 10% of those occur uh, when the driver at fault was known to fall asleep at the wheel. So thousands of auto fatalities occurring as a result of psychomotor vigilance lapses. Don't be that driver. Don't skimp on sleep. Thank you for your time.